Hello, everyone. Um, welcome back to the another edition of Hanover Seminar Series. Um, we have Hilary Klein uh, from uh, the uh, Michigan History Center and DNR. She'll be talking about Michigan foreign history. The first time I met her was in one of the SF meetings, and he mm -hmm. presented the talk, and I was like, "Oh, I don't know, so I don't know that much about the history of Michigan." And then we, 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 our forest history of the forest in Michigan, mm -hmm. and it it was wonderful doing it. And then we invited her. Thank you for accepting our invitation, and then doing the presentation. I will let you talk now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so thank you so much for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so yeah, I am Hillary Pine. I am the Northern Lower Peninsula Historian, if you care to know my whole title, uh, with the Michigan History Center and DNR. I'm responsible for Hartwick Pine State Park, uh, the history there, the logging museum there, uh, along with the Michigan Civilian Conservation Corps Museum and the Higgins Lake Nursery, which we are gonna talk about today. Michigan's uh, first tree nursery, and today that's located at North Higgins Lake State Park in Ross Common. And uh, me personally, I live in Tenegnes, so I live just on the north side of the bridge. Uh, I am a Uper, born and raised. Uh, my dad was a forester for almost four decades on the Hiawatha National Forest, so uh, he thinks it's pretty funny that today I talk about logging and forestry uh, when my background is very much in history and museums. Ooh. All right, there, sorry about that. Uh, okay, so to give you an idea about Michigan's landscape pre-logging era. Uh, so in 1831, Alexis de Tocqueville, who is a French diplomat and historian, he visits Michigan and he has this really fantastic quote that he says about visiting here. In vain, you climb the tallest trees only to find yourself surrounded by others still taller. To no avail, you climb the hills for the forest climbs with you everywhere. So you really get this idea of a very densely forested landscape. He's trying to, you know, climb to the tallest tree to get a view of the land, and he just can't because there are just more and more trees. Uh, but also, uh, yes, a great deal of the state is densely forested, but about 17% of it is wetland, and malaria is a huge problem for early settlers in Michigan. And this map here, is a uh, map of malarial diseases in uh, the United States. And so you can see Michigan here, and I apologize if you're on Zoom, I, I, I don't think you're gonna see this laser pointer, uh, but you can see the lower peninsula and basically the lower half or even two thirds of it is red, uh, showing that that is a hot spot for malaria. And in fact, here at Michigan Agricultural College in 1858, uh, in the latter part of August and for part of September, there were 70 out of 100 students unable to attend classes due to malaria. I know uh, when I was going to college, I took a lot of sick days, but never from malaria. <laughs> and uh, a series of state and federal drainage laws were enacted throughout the 1800s that really alleviated this malaria, this malaria issue. And uh, this gives you a rough idea of what our forests look like pre-logging era. Uh, so this gray kind of hash mark shaded area, kind of north of the Bay City Saginaw area and into the Upper Peninsula, that is that coniferous white pine forest. Uh, and an 1815 survey in present day Jackson County resulted in a report to Washington DC stating that the state consisted of swamps, lakes and poor sandy soil and was not worth the cost to survey. And uh, that is very funny because later on we'll talk about how billions of dollars were made from this poor sandy soil. <laughs> Uh, and, and in the 1820s, the Saginaw region was described as wet and swampy district, which uh, it was because, again, remember back to that malaria map. 
uh, and it can never be settled, uh, which obviously uh, wasn't true. It very much was settled and uh, became one of the hearts of the white pine logging era where you find a lot of those lumber baron homes today. And you can see in this map uh, in the crook of the thumb, right there, there's a white spot. So that is that swampy area. And prior to logging reaching Michigan, uh, logging was happening in North America as soon as Europeans came here. Uh, it was a very important export back to Europe. And there's this, what's called the Pine Belt, this dark green area, um, a little bit here, and going kind of through Maine, New York, Pennsylvania, and across into Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota. And uh, in, uh, in the colonies, at the time, there was a, a very early version of what we no now know as a log mark called the King's Broad Arrow. And it was very simple, just made with a hatchet, um, one hatchet mark vertically to kind of at angles to that uh, to create the look of an arrow. And that told everybody that this was for the king or queen and you couldn't cut this tree down, right? So it was royal property. Uh, because if you are seafaring countries, as most of these European countries were, and you want to explore and have more shipping, uh, you have to build ships, right? And in order to build ships, you need large timber to do that. Uh, so that is the really the reason why timber was such an important export back to Britain and Europe. And fairly quickly, East Coast pine is exhausted. Uh, so before the Civil War, by the 1840s, logging reaches Michigan. And early logging uh, is very small, very simple. Uh, the lumberjacks are maybe working in teams of 10 to 12. They're living in what we would call a shanty. Just that's this log building you see on the slide here. Uh, very simple log structure. You can't see it in this photo, but there's probably a square hole in the roof. That's the chimney. So, uh, you know, just a very quickly put together building. Anything that's not cutting down trees, so uh, cooking, doing their laundry, filing the axes, all of that, it's happening in that building, sleeping, all of it. And in 1840, it's estimated there's enough pine to cut Michigan's forests for about 500 years. And from 1840 to 1860, logging proceeds at about the same rate as it did on the East Coast. But by the 1860s, 66 to 69 specifically, the Transcontinental Railroad is being built. And usually when we think of railroads, you think about steel or metal, but railroads also take a huge amount of lumber to construct ties, bridges, all of that. So all of a sudden there's this increased need and increased demand for lumber. And then in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire happens. And to rebuild Chicago, again, there's this huge demand for lumber. And Michigan rises to meet that demand. And because of this huge demand, you know, technology at the time wasn't there. They weren't cutting fast enough. They couldn't get logs uh, to the mills quick enough. But these three technological advances all happened around the same time in the 1870s that really made the logging era, you know, what we call it, the white pine logging era of Michigan. And uh, that first piece of technology is the big wheels. So this image on the upper right, that is a set of Michigan big wheels or logging wheels. And these allow you to log in the summer. So prior to these big wheels being used, logging was a winter only job. Uh, so Think about what a typical forest floor might look like. Lots of downed logs. Maybe there's muddy spots. If you just have a normal size wagon, it's going to get stuck or broken. But once you have these 10 foot high wheels, uh, you can plow through pretty much anything with two strong draft horses. So now uh, you can log all year round, not just in the winter. And then the narrow gauge railroad really gets uh, perfected, has a specialized steam engine that gets used. And this allows them to access hard to reach places. So stands of pine, like at Hartwick Pines, uh, where there is no navigable river nearby. 
So you can't have a river drive. You know, these logs might be 10 miles from a large river. So now we lay a narrow gauge railroad track and we can very quickly get those logs out. And the third very important piece of technology is the crosscut saw with the addition of a raker tooth. And uh, the raker tooth is patented in the 1870s. It is this extra tooth right here, uh, kind of Y-shaped, and it is not cutting any wood. Its sole job is to scrape the sawdust out of the cut in the tree. And with one of these saws, it takes about 15 minutes to cut down a large white pine. Obviously, it depends on the size of the tree, but roughly 15 minutes. Uh, so whereas before with axes, maybe it took anywhere from half hour to an hour to cut down a large tree. Uh, so now they can cut very quickly. They can cut anywhere with the narrow gauge railroad and they can cut all year round. And the dates differ, you know, what you're reading or who you're talking to, but we can say that our Michigan's logging era is 1860 to 1910. And 1870 to 1900, we are the leading producer of lumber in the nation. So anywhere, uh, if you're buying furniture in New York City, if you are building a house in St. Louis, you're building a railroad track somewhere, all of that lumber is coming from Michigan. And by 1897, 162 billion board feet of lumber has been cut in Michigan. And that is enough wood to cover the entire states of Connecticut and Rhode Island with wood flooring one inch thick. And by 1910, $4 billion has been made in Michigan's logging industry. Remember, out of that poor sandy soil, that wasn't worth the cost to survey. <laughs> and uh, in today's dollars, that's roughly $876 billion. And I added this photo uh, on the right. This is a very uh, famous photo. I get a lot of questions about it. This is what's called the World's Fair Load or the World Record Load. And this is not typical. <laughs> uh, a typical load of logs would maybe be three rows high pulled by two horses. But this uh, was in 1893. This was Michigan's contribution to the World Fair in Chicago. So uh, you, they put this load together. They did build a special road. This, these horses did pull it a very short distance. Uh, this is not typical. Two horses could typically not pull this load. It wouldn't be safe. <laughs> they were just showing off. <laughs> and with all these increases in technology, now there's uh, a huge growth in camp operations. So we went, we go from this tiny little shanty with 10 people to now essentially a small town, many structures, lots of people, potentially 200 people working there. People are coming from all over the world to work in Michigan logging camps. Uh, I've seen an account of a Chinese cook in a logging camp. Uh, so when I, so they truly were coming from all over the world. Uh, this was a very good paying job. In the 1890s, a lumberjack was getting paid about a dollar a day, which doesn't sound good, but uh, in today's dollars, taking you know uh, Christmas off and Sundays off, that's roughly a $40,000 salary. Uh, and this is before income tax and they're not paying rent. They get the bunkhouse to live in for free. So uh, they were dangerous jobs, but good jobs and they were plentiful. And the river drives, which I, I briefly mentioned already, uh, even once narrow gauge railroad technology picks up, river drives are still being utilized to transport logs and uh, an idea of scale. Uh, so for those online, uh, I know you can't see my pointer, but look closely, there are people standing on those logs. Uh, so here, I don't know if you can see, they kind of blend in with the black and white image, but there are a bunch of people standing. Uh, so this is a log jam. This is what you don't want to happen. These are very destructive. Uh, one of the only ways to get rid of a log jam is to blow it up with dynamite, which of course is not safe, but also uh, not safe for the logs. You're destroying this valuable merchandise um, and also not safe for the people working the drive. And just another image of a log drive so it wasn't always chaos like the previous image. Uh, they could be quite orderly. Um, here, the logs have been rafted. You can see they're um, connected here with pegs and rope. And of course, as can be expected, these practices were extremely devastating to our river systems. Uh, so you get a ton of erosion 
the image on the right, you're seeing how they use the hillside as a log slide to get the logs from the bank up top down into the river and then float them to the mill. Uh, here, this just looks like general <laughs> devastation. Uh, so when the shady trees are cut down, the water's heating up. Um, fish like the grayling, that like very cold, clean water. Um, that water is not cold anymore. It's not so clean anymore from all the, the silt and debris that the logs are depositing. All of these spawning grounds are destroyed because if you are a logging company running logs, you certainly don't want any downed logs in the river blocking your, your path. So all of that stuff is removed. So all of those quiet little places that fish love to lay their eggs, those are all gone. Uh, so we have a, a erosion, habitat loss. The water is warm and dirtier. Uh, just you can see how many problems arose because of these practices. And of course, the forest is just absolutely devastated. Uh, and remember back to that map of where Pine, white pine likes to grow in Michigan. So primarily they're cutting white pine by the 1890s. They're really just cutting everything. Uh, but this is what the landscape for the most part looked like. It is cut, it is burnt, there is erosion. Oh, that's in the next slide. Okay, we'll get back to erosion. <laughs> but there's also these devastating forest fires so I, I already mentioned the Chicago fire in 1871, but at that same time, that was a very, very dry summer. And Michigan is also burning from Lake Michigan all the way across to Lake Huron. And that fire burns 2.5 million acres, destroyed 3,000 buildings, killed 200 people. Uh, and fires like this one are happening time and time again. Uh, and one of the reasons is because of slash. So these logging companies, they don't want the skinny tops of trees or branches or needles. And there are feet high piles of slash all over the state that just gets left behind. It's the whole place is a tinderbox. And we think that by 1912, more Michigan trees were likely destroyed by fire than by logging. And in 1912, in the annual forestry report of the Game Fish and Forestry Department, the, uh, this quote that uh, is, is a wonderful and sad quote, uh, they say that forest fires are a calamity, the, cap the capitalization is theirs, and rank properly with flood, pestilence, famine, and earthquakes. And this image on the right is from a fire in 1908 in the village of Metz, which is near Alpena. Uh, you can see how the tracks have twisted from the heat of the fire. and erosion. Uh, this is just this apocalyptic image of these trees that have been cut and the topsoil has blown away. And uh, that's really the only way I can think of to describe it. it it's apocalyptic, right? And uh, what happens with a lot of this land, logging companies don't want it anymore. They got their money out of it. They advertise it as farmland unsuspecting folks are like, oh yeah, that's a great deal. You've already cut the trees down. And they buy it, they try to farm, but most of this land is very sandy, acidic soil, not good for farming. So most of these farms fail uh, through unpaid taxes. Uh, a lot of them end up in state, a lot of this land ends up in state control. And today, when you go up into Northern Michigan, you might notice there is a whole lot of public land, whether today it's state park, state forest, national forest. Uh, and most of that is because of this, because of this tax reversion. But now it is 2023 and our forest and you drive up north, uh, like, you know, and I just drove south today and I saw forests. I drove, the color was wonderful. Uh, you know, it's this beautiful landscape. It is not this apocalyptic place with roots sticking out of the forest and rivers that are destroyed, right? Uh, we, especially up in the Grayling area, are known for world-class fly fishing, uh, canoeing, kayaking. A little shout out for our great trail systems at, like at Hartwick Pines. <laughs> and of course, uh, the Kirtland Warbler that is not on the uh, endangered list anymore. So, you know, how, how did we get here? How did we go from this apocalyptic, destroyed forest, destroyed rivers to this? Well, I can't be here at MSU without talking about uh, 
William Beale. And uh, I assume most of you have heard of Beale. And up in Grayling, we have the Beale Plantation that he did in the 1880s. And uh, you can still go visit it. He did this big uh, experimental effort to plant all kinds of different trees. You know, how, how do you plant trees? How does that work? And uh, he was also the director of the Michigan Forestry Commission. This is before it was an official state entity uh, from 1889 to 1892. It was officially a state department in 1899, uh, but he was trying. Him and some other folks were really trying to convince the state. And in the 1880s, no one would listen. We're, the state was making so much money from logging. Why would you ever need a forestry commission? Why would you plant the forest? We are trying to cut the forest. Right. So it wasn't until 1899 that uh, the powers that be listened and started a forestry commission as a state department. And that commission started the first state nursery in 1904 at Higgins Lake. And these two other gentlemen were very instrumental uh, in those early nursery operations. This gentleman on the left, Philbert Roth, he was the first nursery manager. And uh, he, he was on the Forestry Commission. This is also the gentleman that had that great quote earlier that said, forest fires are a calamity. <laughs> That's him. And on the right, this is Marcus Schaff. He was uh, took over as nursery manager in 1910, and he was given the title of Michigan's first state forester. He also constructed, uh, convinced the state to give him money to construct the first built fire tower uh, for the nursery. And this is what the nursery looked like at the height of operation. It was 48 acres in size, kind of looks like a checkerboard. If you come visit today, uh, there's trail systems going through a lot of this, but uh, the parking lot is in here. And some of these windrows you can still uh, very much identify. And uh, there are some original structures down in here you can come see. Also that fire tower I mentioned is in this area. And I'm sorry for those online that can't see my laser pointer. Um, just know that <laughs> you can come visit today. You can see some original structures from this nursery operation. And here's just a, a great early photo of nursery operations, uh, what it looks like. Uh, this, these are seed beds that he is rolling flat and, uh, to prepare for seed planting. And by the 1920s, the nursery is harvesting uh, and li excuse me, lifting over 20 million seedlings a year. Uh, so at, at the time in the 1920s, it was the largest pine nursery in the world. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. When they first started in 1904, it was a huge experiment, you know, kind of going off of what Beale had started in the 1880s. And they, it was really an experiment. How deep do you plant the seeds? How close do you plant them together? Uh, how often do you water them? all of those questions, right? It was this huge experiment. Nobody had tried to grow seedlings on such a scale before. It, it hadn't happened. So it really took about a decade of experimentation to figure out how to do things properly. By 1915, uh, they realized, you know, they really had things down. Uh, prior to 1915, they were trying to grow all sorts of things like eucalyptus, <laughs> which uh, seems silly. So in 1915, that's when they really focus in on, okay, we need to plant white pine, that's what was cut, and red pine and jack pine, you know, really focusing on those native species that needed to be replanted. And we're not just trying to regrow our forests, we also have to think about firefighting and prevention. So those terrible fires, like in 1871, they are still a problem uh, throughout through the 1920s and into the 30s. So these fire towers start being built. Uh, this fire tower on the left is a very early one. This is what the fire tower at the Higgins Lake Nursery would have looked like, that very first one that you can come see. Uh, just not too tall, This just this open platform to stand on. Later on into the 1920s, they start building these much taller 100 foot high towers with an enclosed cabin up top and a uh, cabin down below for the towermen to sleep in. 
and education. So of course, we today think about uh, firefighting prevention and education. You think we think about Smokey Bear, but uh, back in the 1920s and 30s, folks for the first time are getting in cars and they're driving up north and they are camping and picnicking. And to us today, it's very second nature. Don't throw a cigarette out the window, put out your campfire before you leave, of course. But at that time, this was all very new, right? Folks are tra really traveling the roads for the very first time. Uh, none of this is second nature to them. So the at the time, the Department of Conservation, right now the DNR, uh, they spend a lot of money. The, uh, the majority of their firefighting budget is actually spent on education. They spend it on billboards. So putting billboards up on these roads, like, you know, put out your force or put out your campfire, uh, don't throw your, your cigarette butt out the window. And they also spend a lot of time talking to the railroad companies. So at the time in the 1920s, the leading cause of forest fires in Michigan was sparks from steam engines. So the Department of Conservation spent a huge amount of time and money convincing railroad companies to put spark arresters on their steam engines, uh, which worked by the 1930s uh, for some other reasons, but this system of fire towers uh, and this, all this education and prevention work that the Department of Conservation did really works and the acreage burned every year um, keeps going down and down and down. And also in 1929, the Roscommon Equipment Center, it has a big long name, a Roscommon Equipment Center and Forest Fire Experiment Station uh, was constructed and that is still alive and well today. And they are, are designing tools for the future of wildland fire, firefighting they provide fire agencies across the nation with specialized wildland firefighting equipment from its cutting edge design and fabrication shop. And so they are still doing this work today and they were doing it in starting in 1929. And early things like this image in the center, uh, this gentleman is testing out a plow to dig a fire line and early plows were not strong enough when they tried to till a fire break they would break because it's untilled forest floor. So they spent a lot of time coming up with this reinforced, really strong plow to do this work. And this image on the right is called a sand caster. As you can imagine, it's, it's you can see it's casting sand onto the fire. And, uh, you know, fire is still still a problem. Uh, we deal with it, obviously, in very different ways today than we were in the 1930s. So we got so good at detecting and putting out fires that, uh, you know, that kind of came back to hurt us a little bit because, uh, you know, some fire obviously is very good for an ecosystem. Some tree species like jack pine is fire dependent uh, and birds like the Kirtland warbler only nest in young jack pine. So uh, that is something that we really had to work on was planting jack pine to get that bird back up. Uh, and we still have fires just this June in Grayling, about eight miles south of Hartwick Pine State Park. Uh, there was a fire that burned about 2,400 acres. And I found this cool aerial view of it. And so, so much of how we got to now, how we get to this uh, forested landscape today, healthy rivers, uh, healthy habitats, can be directly linked to the work of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And I'm going to blow through some of this CCC info. I have a whole hour long presentation on the CCC because they did so much. But uh, this was a federal program during the Great Depression in the 1930s. It in the name tells you what they did. So it's it's civilians doing conservation work. And it is a system of camps. And uh, I have the next slide, we'll talk about a little more about what they did. But on the left, uh, this young man, uh, so this is a, a program for primarily for young single men, anywhere from 18 to 25 years old. If your family was on government assistance, you could sign up for this program, you get sent to a camp. And this guy has probably never fought a fire before. He has no training in wildland firefighting. He has been handed probably a shovel and given this backpack sprayer. And he is fighting this fire. 
right? So uh, for a lot of these young men, they come from places like Detroit and Jackson and Flint, and they might be up on Isle Royal fighting a fire. Uh, it was hard work and often scary and work. Uh, oftentimes they, they were ill-equipped for. And this young man on the right, he is planting a tree. <laughs> as uh, they planted many. So here, all these things that they did. So uh, throughout the program from 1933 to 1942, we had 124 CCC camps here in Michigan. And the enrollees got paid $30 per month. 25 of that went directly home uh, to their families or into a savings account. It was a six month commitment that they signed up for. So if you left early, say, oh, this work is too hard. Uh, this is not what I was expecting. And you left, uh, it was kind of like being dishonorably discharged from the military. Uh, you would have a dishonorable discharge, which could make it difficult to find work. More difficult than it already was to find work at the time. Here in Michigan, just in Michigan, this program plants 484 million trees. Nationwide, the program plants about a billion trees. So half of that is planted here in Michigan. I mean, that is just astronomical. The, when they were tree planting, the boys were expected to plant a thousand seedlings per day. <laughs> I mean, just the, the work is, to, it's mind boggling to think of the level of reforestation that they were doing. They build 7,000 miles of roads and 504 bridges. A lot of these roads, uh, they, they aren't just roads. It's not to get from point A to point B. Uh, they're serving multiple purposes. These roads are fire breaks. So now we have this brand new system, 7,000 miles of fire breaks crisscrossing the state. Uh, uh, forest roads that many folks still enjoy today. Um, snowmobile trails, ATV, that kind of stuff. Um, it is also... If you can see a fire, so we have all these fire towers now, but if you can see the fire, but there's no road to get you there, how do you fight it, right? It's very difficult. So now these roads are fire breaks, but it also allows access into the forest uh, to fight these blazes. And all in all, the seas in Michigan spend 140,000 man days fighting forest fires. Uh, when there was a fire, that takes precedent over everything else. If you were in the field planting trees, maybe you're building a trail in a state park or a bathroom building, uh, you would drop everything and you would be sent to go fight this fire. Uh, in 1936, there was a fire that blazed all summer on Isle Royal, and many Michigan enrollees were sent there to help. They built 221 buildings. Uh, an example of that, if you've ever been to Ludington State Park, to the bathhouse there, uh, they built that. They built the logging museum buildings at Hartwick Pines. They brought electricity and phone to rural areas. Prior to this program, prior to the depression, uh, only about 30% of Michigan had electricity. So uh, they did you know, very important work to, to bring these modern conveniences to rural Michigan. They built state parks. They built the entirety of the Sini National Wildlife Refuge. That place did not exist prior to the CCC. It was a swamp and logged over land. Uh, they built dams, ditches, dikes, ponds, planted grasses, all kinds of things. They built a lot of the infrastructure on Isle Royal National Park. Education was also a huge part of this program. So not only are you coming and helping the conservation needs here in Michigan, uh, you, if you were an enrollee, uh, could earn your eighth grade diploma. You could finish high school. So think about the midst of the depression. A lot of these boys had left school to try to help their families. You know, they're trying to find work. They're trying to earn money. Uh, so most of them have not completed eighth grade. So this program allows them uh, in the evening back at camp they can finish eighth grade, finish high school, and they can even take correspondence classes through the University of Michigan. Most enrollees gained 10 to 15 pounds within the first three months of enrollment. Uh, so many of them were malnourished. They get to camp, they 
have not been eating three square meals a day, probably far from that. And now for the first time, potentially in years, they have access to adequate nutrition. And not only nutrition, but everything else they need is provided to them at camp. Shoes, socks, underwear, toothbrush, toothpaste, soap, um, winter hats, all of it. It's all provided for them. Many of these boys, when they're waiting for the train to get to camp, they do not have shoes to wear. So uh, you can see how amazing this program was for the participants uh, and for Michigan's conservation needs. And in total, Michigan enrollees sent $20 million home to their families. Here's some CCC boys uh, doing forestry work. This young man on the left is, uh, looks like he's collecting some cones. The upper right photo is a enrollee working at the Higgins Lake Nursery. He is processing cones in the cone barn, drying those out to extract the seed. And in the lower right, looks like these guys are transplanting some seedlings. And I'll read this. So don't, don't worry about reading all that text, but uh, I think it's important when you talk about the seas um, to leave you with a few quotes to kind of get an understanding of how important this work uh, was and what they're experiencing. So uh, Michael Radage, who was a CCC enrollee who actually worked at the CCC Museum for a long time. Uh, I unfortunately never had the honor of meeting him, but he said on Life Before the Seas, I had nothing to do. You couldn't have any money to buy anything, so you stole or did without. The soles of my shoes kept falling off and I taped them, but they did not hold and kept falling off. Michael Radage also said, once you got into camp, you wanted to get home, but after receiving a letter from your family who received $25 and told you what they had been able to purchase with that money, a coat, food, and wood for the stove, you felt for the first time that you were helping your family and nothing could induce you to leave the CCC. And an anonymous enrollee said, I remember one night we missed the truck back to camp and had to walk from Cook's Corners to camp, which was about 15 miles. It was a moonlit night and the temperature was down to minus 20. This was the night I heard a wolf howl, not a coyote. <laughs> and Robert Fivey from Camp Germfast said, I'd gotten my boots wet that day and it was so cold overnight in the unheated barracks that my boots stuck to the floor. <laughs> so you can see how, uh, you know, they feel they're doing important work, but, uh, you know, conditions weren't great. <laughs> Sometimes uh, they were spending the winter in tents because the camp hadn't been built yet. Uh, so imagine winter in the UP living in a tent. <laughs> and you know, a few of these things we already mentioned, of course, this program is having a huge impact on local communities as well. Uh, that electricity and telephone that I mentioned, they're helping dig out after severe snowstorms. They are helping find missing people they employed locals. So not only is this employing, you know, young men from Michigan who are out of work, also they're employing people like this gentleman here, who is obviously older, uh, not a young enrollee. He is teaching these guys how to file a saw. And in the government, we love acronyms. So we call him an LEM or a local experienced man. And he is someone from the community. He knows this skill. So the camp has hired him to come in and teach this skill. Uh, so the foresters overseeing all of the tree planting, right? Those are local experienced men. Those are out of work foresters who the CCC is paying uh, to supervise this work and to teach the boys about forestry. Uh, it's gonna depend on the camp, different skills that are being taught at uh, Camp Higgins Lake, for example. They're learning drafting skills and surveying. Obviously, somebody in the local community must have been an out-of-work surveyor and drafter. They are purchasing supplies from local towns. So these camps are run by the War Department because it is a federal program. But, uh, you know, they're getting their bulk, like dry goods, from the War Department. Uh, any fresh meat fruit, any of that stuff that is coming locally from small towns. And in total, the CCC spent about $95 million in Michigan. And the, those enrollees sent $20 million home to their families, which in today's dollars, that $20 million is about $1.6 billion.
And today, uh, I, I think this pie chart is a couple years old. So these numbers might not be totally up to date, but uh, this gives an idea of what our forests look like today. Um, today, even though we're only the 22nd largest state by area, we are the 10th largest forested state with 20 million acres. And uh, this pie chart shows you, you know, the biggest piece here is family owned forest, about uh, 9.2 million acres. Then you have uh, the part that I know a lot about, <laughs> the purple slice that is state forest uh, with 4.2 million acres. You have 2.7 million federal acres. Uh, corporate is also a large chunk of that, 2.6 million. And yeah, so this logging era and CCC impact, you know, even though we have recovered, you know, from those devastating photos I started with, uh, you can still see some of this evidence on the landscape. This photo on the right is the Kingston Plains in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, I know it's near where I am from. This is a very popular snowmobiling spot <laughs> in the winter time when all those stumps are covered up with snow. But you can see it is a stump field. It is just a field of stumps. We also have a stump field at Hartwick Pines. And what has happened here is obviously the forest was cut and those fires burned so often and so hot that it wasn't that healthy amount of fire. This was too much. The Any seeds in the soil were cooked, any nutrients left in the soil, it was all cooked. So even today, this is what grows here. It's just very shrubby grasses. Um, yeah, if you come to the one at Hartwick Pines, it's just grass. We've had scout groups come in and try to plant trees and they die. So, you know, even, you know, a hundred plus years later, it is, you still can't really grow things here. And this image on the left, uh, this is a CCC red pine plantation in DeWard, which is what we'd call a ghost town near Grayling today. Uh, so yeah, if you ever, are going along and you see these, uh, huh, those oddly, uh, th those red pine are growing in very straight lines. <laughs> um, obviously that is uh, often CCC planted red pine. And uh, they did plant other things, the CCC, they were planting jack pine and white pine as well. But at the time, uh, I don't know, it must've just been good years for red pine cones. <laughs> I get that question a lot. You know, why did, were they planting red pine? And um, I think it was probably just really good year for, for red pine cones and they had a lot of seed. <laughs> so yeah, that I think I, I got through that. It was pretty good time. Yes. So if we have uh, questions in the room or online, um, I will, before I take questions, I will remind you that I am a historian. My background is in museums and history. Uh, I do work with really fabulous forestry professionals. So I have, they have taught me a lot, um, but you know, I'm still a historian, not a forester. <laughs> so some of you uh, maybe can answer the questions if I don't know the answer. <laughs> Yeah, I was curious. Um, it's obvious that the Civilian Conservation Corps did a whole lot in this region in regards to forestry specifically and then the management that kind of surrounds that. Do you know how that might compare to other CCC efforts in other states that might have not had the extensive forestry history that Michigan did or otherwise? Yeah, really. So I am. Oh, so for those online, uh, we had a question about, uh, you know, can, can basically can I speak to the CCC efforts in other states and what what that looks like? Um, so really, it's individual to the state. So when this program was enacted and there's funding, uh, the federal so at the time when it first started, it's called Emergency Conservation Work. And this department, federal department of emergency conservation work, they reach out to local entities. And they're like, hey, we have this much money to start some CCC camps. What projects do you have 
that maybe uh, would be good enough to start a camp, big enough to start a camp. Michigan had a whole lot. <laughs> but um, so it just depends on other states, what need they have. Uh, so think about the Dust Bowl is happening at the same time. So a lot of camps are out in the, the Plains area working on, you know, soil, soil conservation out there. Um, a lot of, you know, like I mentioned with the people starting to travel, so states are definitely seeing this need in na in national parks and in state parks. So just like in Michigan, how they're building state parks, um, they're doing that stuff around the country as well. Uh, they're building the Blue Ridge Parkway. That's a project that most people are know about. Yeah, so it really just depends on the state um, and they are working. This program is all over uh, the continental United States, but they are also doing work in uh, Puerto Rico. They're, yeah, they're doing work all over the place. Mm -hmm. Interesting. It's a short follow-up. Uh, I imagine it would be safe to say that a lot of the early efforts from Beale and others to get the experimental forestry plantations underway probably played a, a outsourced role in shaping the efforts of the CCC. Mm. So, yeah, so you had a comment uh, for those online about Beal and, you know, if, if his early work kind of, so you're saying like they kind of shaped the, or Beal's work kind of shaped what the CCC was doing in, yeah, in Michigan? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I think you can very much follow that legacy from Beal through to, to Roth and Schaff. And yeah, into the the twenties, the work at the Higgins Lake Nursery, and yeah, it's these really influential people. Um, oh, why is the name escaping me? Uh, not Pincho, the other guy. <laughs> uh, no, no, uh, early, early um, Forest Service person, National Forest Service. Oh, who am I? No, anyone? Anyone online? Who am I? Who am I thinking about? <laughs> Anyways, the Michigan Forestry Commission are consulting, you know, people in the, the National Forest Service um, reaching out like we want to uh, start this nursery. What do, what do we do? We want to start a state forest. How do we do that? <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's and their work is recognized. Michigan's work, you know, early on at the Higgins Lake Nursery, it, it is recognized nationally. It's like, oh, wow, Michigan's doing some some big, important work there. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So sticking with the theme of the civilian conservation forest, when I travel, I'm so impressed with all the infrastructure that they have built for national parks throughout the, the U.S. And was there any controversy in establishing that program? And uh, and then what ultimately killed it? Was it <laughs> a lack of, of need for that type of work? If you had people yes yeah so the the question is you know um why did it end why did the program end and was there controversy uh so yes there very much was controversy and it cost the taxpayers a lot of money uh, as you can imagine, it's a system of camps. They're building buildings. They're supplying all of these men nationwide throughout the history of the program. There was a million enrollees uh, here in Michigan. We had a hundred thousand enrollees. So you're giving, you're, you're feeding all those people, housing them, clothing them, giving them soap, toothbrushes, on and on and on, all that stuff. So uh, it was extremely expensive. So people right away were upset about that. As we get closer to World War II. Uh, they do start drilling at camps, not with weapons, but uh, they are like drilling, doing military style drill exercises. So that definitely becomes a point of controversy. And a lot of people say, you know, you are going to turn my son into your perfect little soldier. And they kind of did. <laughs> uh, and of course, as we get closer to 42, unemployment is way down, you know, in the midst of the depression, like in 1933, I think our, here in Michigan, our average unemployment was like 34%. Uh, black 
unemployment in the Detroit area was over 50%. Native American unemployment was over 60%. Uh, so it was, unemployment rates just were very high. But as you get closer to, four, to 42 and entering World War II, those unemployment rates go way, way down. So now it's this, there's not a huge need for it anymore employment wise, and it's very expensive. And you're turning our sons into your perfect little soldiers. So come 1942, I think everyone sees where the country's headed and the funding is not re-upped, re-approved. So the program was actually never canceled. They just didn't get any more funding. So <laughs> technically it, it sort of still exists, <laughs> but I'm very interested in, and I uh, honestly, I, I haven't had time to read too much about it, um, but I just saw that President Biden did something with uh, Climate Corps, like announced some kind of Climate Corps, um, which I'm very interested in seeing what comes of that. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So I'm super fascinated that about half of the trees planted during that time is in Michigan mm -hmm. across the years. And uh, was it it's because the uh, Michigan forest was so in bad shape because of the combination of logging and forest fire, and mm -hmm. they have to like plant something back up. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yes. Yeah. So the, the yes, yes. So the comment was, uh, you know, nationwide the CCC plants a billion trees. Half of that is planted here in Michigan. About half. And uh, yeah. So if I go. So give me a second, let me go back to the start of my slideshow. Um, so this, to remind you, this is what, roughly, this is what folks think our forests look like pre-logging era. Uh, so you have this line from the Bay City area across kind of down to Muskegon-ish. And again, I'm a youper, so I'm sorry if I have those uh, names wrong, but... <laughs> Uh, where you have this gray, so it goes from black to a lighter gray, uh, that almost in its entirety is cut, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that, when the CCC are uh, replanting those 484 million trees, uh, they are planting in here and in the Upper Peninsula, and that's also where the camps are clustered. So you only find a couple of camps down here in the Southern Lower. Most of them are clustered up here in the Northern Lower and in the UP and a few on Isle Royal. So that, yeah, it's all those camps. We are, we're not in the top three, but I think we're in the top five with the amount of CCC camps we had, you know, how we rank with other states and how many camps they had. Uh, and that speaks to that need. Even though we're nowhere near the largest state by size, uh, we just had this huge conservation need. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is a fantastic question. Uh, so the question has to do with uh, Black and Native American people in the CCC and if that program kind of helped or, or hurt uh, those relations. Uh, so when FDR enacted this program in 33, he wanted it to be an integrated program. And it was at first, camps were integrated until 1935. And most of the outcry was from the South, as you can imagine uh, at the time, it camps were encountering a lot of, even in Michigan, especially in the UP, were encountering a lot of difficulties with uh, enrollees, black enrollees going into town. Uh, enrollees did, they got weekends off. They went to the theater and they went to community dances and they walked around, you know, they're, they're young guys. They wanna go out and have a good time. And uh, you basically have um, situations that like where a mob would encounter, uh, you know, very kind of violently black enrollees who are just trying to enjoy their day off. Um, you have black enrollees being uh, put in jail in the camp 
uh, captain has to go get them out of jail. Uh, so there are a lot of problems here in Michigan. Is Those are the stories I know about, but um, I think we can all kind of imagine the awful things that must have happened in Southern integrated CCC camps. Uh, so that just wasn't working out. Uh, and the program in 1935 was segregated. In Michigan, we had 11 black camps and they were all in the Northern Lower. None of them were in the UP and they were all quite rural. Uh, we had one Native American camp. So I, a Native American, of, co of course, if, if you are Native, you, so my great grandpa uh, is in, was a Native person. He was in the CCC, just in a regular CCC camp in the UP. But uh, you could also go to, through the Bureau of Indian Affairs, there are a system of Native American camps. And we had one of those in Michigan. It was Camp Marquette. And it was, I do not know its exact location, uh, but it was west of Sault Ste. Marie, somewhere in here. And so we, uh, those, those Native American camps had much looser guidelines. They didn't have those strict age got enrollment guidelines. You didn't have to sign up for six months. You could come and go. Oh, it's fall. My family really needs me back, you know, to help out on the farm. Like, okay. See you in a couple months, come back. Uh, so it was very loosey-goosey. Uh, apparently the food was really good <laughs> in Native American camps um, because they didn't, have, they didn't have to pay attention to those really strict War Department guidelines. But uh, yeah, so it was an interesting time uh, racially as, as we can all, I think, imagine. And it's a part of the CCC, you know, I only know a, a little bit about and, and I'm always trying to learn more. There's one question uh, from the uh, uh, folks online, and the, the question is, in the latter half of the 19th century, where settlers were spreading further throughout the state, what was happening to indigenous populations and their traditional role of managing forests mm -hmm. in the western section from China? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is something I actually just the other day, I sat in on a, a webinar of, of some Native people in, in California who are now bringing back uh, traditional ways of prescribed burning. Uh, that was very interesting. And so I'm always trying to learn more. Un unfortunately, I, do I don't know all that much. Um, but, you know, as these forests are being cut and, uh, you know, this is also the same time where treaties are being enacted and... Uh, yeah, a lot of people are are losing their traditional lands. They, the forests are being cut. The rivers are being devastated. They simply don't. Maybe they still have access to the land in places, but those places where they might traditionally uh, hunt and and gather, there's nothing there anymore, right? Because of this extreme habitat loss. So uh, I I know I'm not doing probably a great job answering that question. Uh, so again, it's it's a an area of knowledge that I'm always trying to grow in. Thank you very much. Thank you.